Welcome to Afros and Audio's Black History Month interview series. My name is Talib Jassir, founder and CEO of Afros and Audio Podcast Festival and the Vanguard Podcast Network. I'm excited to spotlight 29 outstanding indie podcast creators and professionals who answer the call to be a part of the series. My guest today is Yanni Washington Smith. Welcome and thank you for being here. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for having me, as they say. <laughs> and I'm <laughs> so glad I was saying this before, but people, I grew up at a time when people could not pronounce my name, Yanni. Mm -hmm. So I'm very grateful when people nowadays can pronounce my name. <laughs> Absolutely. It's important. It's your name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I get all sorts of things. Talib, Talib, and it's like, it's five yeah. letters. <laughs> Talib. <laughs> <laughs> but people find a way to, to do things regardless. Yes. So yes. let's start. Could you share a brief overview yeah. of your journey as a writer, producer, editor, and director, particularly focusing on your transition from being a Sundance and Austin second rounder to creating your own shows? Thank you. I tend to be long-winded because I love telling stories. Obviously, I'm a storyteller, but... <laughs> um, I've always been a writer. I'm going to start there at the top. It was a recent realization for me, I would say within the past two years that, okay, I've always been a writer. And um, growing up, I wanted to write for TV and movies, even though I did not know that was a job, job, but I just wanted to do it. When I was coming along, there was a series called Zoom, these kids out of Boston. It was like a public television like a Sesame Street, but for preteens. And I used to send them scripts, like, <laughs> like because they used to do little skits, like, like Saturday Night Live, but kids. Anyway, I've always wanted to write. And so I never at the time figured out how to become a TV writer or film writer other than making my own stuff. I grew up seeing Spike Lee and now Issa Rae, and that's what they did. So I figured, okay, that's what one does in order to eventually get hired, quote, to write TV and film. So I went through the whole process of applying to fellowships and competitions, and I'm not taking anything away from myself or them by saying, like, I did with second round or become a finalist or I was elated. I was thrilled. I was honored. I was like, wow, people are really reading me and getting it. But that was it. Like, I'm still not writing on Girlfriends or Living Signal or I'm still not making movies. So I came to realize maybe about 10 years ago that you can make a radio show. And I started listening to audio dramas and actually Experience Jays was one of them and a couple of others. And I was like, okay, that is my way into Hollywood. And I could afford to do it. And I loved writing and I had to rewrite everything that I wrote for the ear. Like an audio drama is not a TV pilot. It is not a script with sound effects. You are writing just for someone's ear and you're trying to encourage the imagination with the sounds that you create, the story that you tell. So I went into audio dramas because I could afford to do it myself and I could afford to figure out how to do it. There's low entry barrier for it. But before that, let me backtrack and say, I've done many years of freelance as a production assistant, producer, production manager, coordinator, wardrobe assistant, like cost, you know, make up the whole gamut for film and TV and commercials was my bread and butter. So I just started with what I could do. I knew how to produce something. I knew how to call people and ask for stuff and what needed to be asked for and offer people what I could give them. And they accepted it. If they couldn't, they didn't. And I moved on. So that was a big learning lesson for me. Also, it would start with what you have, because number one, it's probably a lot more than you realize that you have. Of course, now I'm realizing, wow, I was so resourceful. I didn't know I could. But these are things that people put on their resumes and say, I did this. And I'm thinking, wow, I did that, but I just did it 
for quote unquote free. <laughs> yeah, the long story is I've always been a writer and I've always wanted to write for film and TV. And I found my way into doing that with audio dramas. And I'm thrilled about it because now people hear these stories all over the world, like places I've never been. And I'm a traveler, I'm proud to say, like I get around, but these are places all over the world. And I have an audience that I imagine I would not have reached so many people if it weren't for what audio dramas can do. I mean, I could not fill a theater like 20 times over. And eventually, of course, Hollywood then comes knocking <laughs> on my door. And so I did have Harlem Queen is option. And um, hopefully in a couple of years, I'm not even gonna say hopefully, we're gonna make this thing. And in a few years, you'll see Stephanie St. Clair on the big screen, which I'm thrilled about. So yeah, that's the that's long story. Awesome. Yeah, no, it was a great story. I loved it. You said so much there in a good way. You are absolutely right. This accessibility of audio dramas, of audio, this is a cornerstone for which so many other things can be built on. I love for you, congratulations on Harlem Queen being an option. That's amazing. And of course, we're going to see it on the big screen. I can't wait for it. <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. That's really great. And something that I think is a teachable moment, especially for folks who are focused on television and web series, for me, it was one of those things where I had to recognize web series are really saturated, especially when I started in 2017. Web series were everywhere but audio dramas weren't, right? And television, there's this barrier, but not for audio dramas. And so there was this opportunity, as I mentioned, Afros and Audio starting because of my audio drama, wanting people to even say, listen, stop knocking on that door if they haven't answered yet. Come yes. over here, make your audio drama. Yes. Because there, there's an opportunity here and it's a real opportunity here. It's viable. It can take you places. They will come knocking. <laughs> you just do your work. Yeah. You know? And that's exactly what's happened. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it took me some time to realize that, okay, if nothing else comes out of this, at least I can say I made my story and people have listened and enjoyed it. As a writer, as a creator, as an artist, that is ultimately my goal, my dream. And it's not a dream deferred. <laughs> it's an actual thing that came to pass. And I'm very, very happy for that. The only thing about audio dramas that exhausts me is having to explain to people what an audio drama is. <laughs> like, I can't call it a radio show because it isn't radio, but I don't want to just say a podcast because they're like, oh, what guests do you have? And then I have to explain, no, I write a script. I have wonderful actors. I have the best sound designer who helps me create the best soundscape with the music. Like I don't, I don't look for music. <laughs> My sound designer does that. And I mean, I probably shouldn't say that, but that is an added benefit with working with one of the best experienced Jay. <laughs> she makes my stuff sound so much better than it. I mean, I'm not taking anything away from myself. I've learned not to do that or the actors. <laughs> but when people talk to me about the shows that I do, it's about the music. It's about the sound, the, you know, facts. It's about the, oh, how did you create this world? It's okay. Yes, it is the writing but it's also a person who takes their time and finds a wooden baseball bat instead of an aluminum baseball bat because the story takes place in 1928 and there were no aluminum baseball bats then. <laughs> so I am, I'm so grateful to have her work on it and take the time to do that. Can you walk us through your creative process in developing an audio drama like Harlem Queen? How do you balance historical accuracy with engaging storytelling? Okay. Thank you. I love this question because, okay, what I always tell people, well, not always, only people who ask, is that I grew up in South Jersey. I grew up in Atlantic City, near Atlantic City, but I moved to Harlem like a long time ago. And so 
being in Harlem, I used to ride my bike to work. Like I literally live in West Harlem and work in East Harlem. So I would ride my bike the width of Harlem, like across 125th Street, 117th, Rover, uh, Marcus Garvey Park, the whole thing. And so I was like, wow. And the jazz club there, Minton's Playhouse on like 117, I think. And I was like, wow, what an era. Why don't we have this anymore? Like the, you know, the whole, what am I imagine? The glamour, the sophistication, the lovely clothes, the music, the cigarettes, the drinks, the cars, the minks, you know? So that's when I decided, oh, wait a minute. I can make this into a story because this is what I enjoy. And ever since I was young, the Harlem Renaissance was one of the pinnacles because I also think the Reconstruction era is an undervalued pinnacle in American history. I'm not even going to, not to say it's not important to say Black history, but these are people who did this stuff in America, in the United States. And it was beautiful what they did anyway. But, um, so I created this series about Zora Neale Hurston because I love Zora Neale Hurston. I loved uh, uh, Their Eyes Were Watching God, blah, 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 woof, woof, woof. When I was a kid, there was no young adult literature. So I had to read to, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, James Baldwin, Toni Morrison. I mean, these things went way over my head anyway. So um, I wrote a story about <laughs> Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes and they had to solve a mystery in Harlem and it was so boring it was so boring it was so bad so I was like okay we need a gangster we need a we need to spice this up we need so I figured I'd find a white gangster in Harlem and I started googling and I looked up uh Casper Holstein came to mind like popped up right away he was a policy banker and uh that means he fixed the lot, not fixed the lottery, but he ran an illegal lottery in Harlem in the 1920s and 30s and so on. And I found like Lucky Luciano and Dutch Schultz and all these, you know, New York people. And then I saw the name Stephanie St. Clair and, and said, Madam Stephanie St. Clair. And I was like, OK, she runs a brothel. And I not not to take anything away from running a brothel, but that's not the direction I was taking my story in. And so I ignored it. And then for some reason, I just came back to it. Anyway, I, I told you I get long-winded, but, um, and uh, I found out who she was and uh, like she ran a policy bank in an illegal lottery. She owned property. She uh, supported the community with uh, sponsorships. I call them sponsorships, scholarships. Um, uh, the women's clubs at that time was a big deal. Like social clubs were a big deal at that time. And she did all, and she was truly a race woman. Like we talk about race men, like Du Bois and Washington and, and, and I, uh, I can't think of anyone else off, but she was truly a person who loved black people and the black community in Harlem and supporting it. And like that whole thing of buy black, she announced that not, not saying she founded it, but which makes sense because she had businesses and she was black. And so she wanted people to support her and, um, and the community as well. Anyway. So I, Switch the story. I kind of took out Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes and just made them a guest at the party. Like it was Stephanie St. Clair's party and they were guests at it. And um, so one, I'm in several writing groups because I always feel like if you're a writer, you should be in a writing group or have someone else read your work. I mean, that's just part of the process. And I remember like one or two people asking me, is this a real person? Like, did this really happen? And I was like offended, but you know, <laughs> three months earlier, I did not know that either. So, I mean, I can't really be mad at them. We all understand why we don't know the certain things that we don't know about our history. So I don't need to go into that, but because at that moment I realized, oh, for a lot of people, the Harlem Renaissance is new. A lot of people may not know who W.E.B. Du Bois is. 
or Marcus Garvey or Charles Johnson, who I honestly, I did not know who that he wrote um, the, we used to call it the Black National Anthem, but Lift Every Voice and Sing. And he was an editor of, um, I want to say Opportunity Magazine. Anyway, um, so because I realized that I'm introducing a lot of things to people, I am, I do try to be mindful and careful of uh, historical accuracy. Like I don't want to put a microwave in 1928 or like how experienced Jay spent a week finding a, me uh, a, a, a wooden baseball bat instead of aluminum bat. Um, so I like throwing these people in there to introduce them to people like Charles Johnson and uh, Lane Locke and, and Wallace Thurman. And um, there's, oh God, so many, uh, the writer, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who I adored when I was a kid, like Jump Back, Baby Jump Back was like, I mean, I was singing that when I was a kid, like his poem anyway. So um, I am mindful of that. And I try to respect that because I'm telling you, Stephanie St. Clair came to me. She's like, I have a story I need to tell and they're going to tell it. So I try to respect that. But also as far as making it dramatic, there are things that I have to uh, indulge in or flourish in order to make it pop. I mean, I don't know any other way to describe it. I want my stories to sound like music. I want <laughs> my stories to have some pop every few beats. And uh, so in order to do that, I create things like Stephanie St. Clair. Uh, I don't know if she sponsored Opportunity Magazine's um, writers competition. I don't have any proof of that. And I do, I'm very proud of the fact that I spent a lot of time researching. I live in Harlem. I can go right to the Schomburg. The Schomburg is great. The librarians are fantastic. And look up the Amsterdam news. I mean, I love looking up these old newspapers and reading about recipes and their summer tours and, and restaurants and advertisements. And Mrs. Stalling visited Mrs. Brown on, on the Cape last week. I mean, people would announce that in the paper. Uh, I just thought that was fascinating. Anyway, so uh, I am mindful of the research and I read, I love reading books, of, obviously and um, listening to music and watching movies like Harlem Nights. I was very influenced by Harlem Nights starring Eddie Murphy. I was very influenced by Wallace Thurman's book, The Blacker, yes. the Berry, Berry, yes. And um, Passing, uh, there was the book, Passing. And um, so, yeah, I put in, I like to have the historical accuracies because I want the names that want people to know these names, but to make it fun, I will add in a party or someone got shot. I mean, believe it or not, like I'm thinking that's fun or someone got, or someone gets kidnapped or someone wins the lottery. I'm giving away some fun stuff in season four that we're planning now but someone wins or someone fixes the numbers. I mean, I'm not saying she did that, but it was not unusual. And once one thing I've learned is that once you learn the history, you can imagine, you can create things. And these things actually, fortunately for me, turn out to be fairly accurate. <laughs> That's my long-winded answer to that. <laughs> well, I love it. Listen, you're speaking my language. Okay. I was joking with one of my uh, good friends that my wife had went away for the weekend. And the, the following Monday, I was telling her about the Zora and the Hurston documentary I watched. And I said, I'm a, you know, a man home by myself while my wife is off for the weekend. I'm sitting here watching Zora and the <laughs> documentaries because that's who I am. I yeah. love that history. My daughter went to the Schomburg Center in the junior scholarship program for three years. Nice, nice. And so I sat there in that library and right. those were those times where we were able to walk the sidewalks together. And I look at her, I'm like, we're walking the same <laughs> sidewalks. You yeah. know that, right? You know, like yes. we're, we're now in a path where right. we're, we're walking the same sidewalks. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. She had the opportunity to help restore Langston Hughes home 
And wow. probably maybe three months later, I was sitting in a writing circle at Langston Hume's wow. old old home in Harlem. So nice. you speak my language. We could, <laughs> we, could, we could geek out on Harlem all day long. Right. If hey, you wanted to. For sure. But yeah, and it's important. And like you said, it happened. Whether it happened with her or not, it happened. Something, yeah, okay. those things went down. Kidnapping, yes. shootings, uh, numbers, and all this sort of things. There's a really good documentary going out right now. I mean, I don't know when it came out, but it's about the time of the uh, Godfather of Harlem. And mm -hmm. it's four parts. And mm -hmm. it's historical about the numbers and all of that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like I said, I love that story. I could sit here and listen to you all day. <laughs> so, and you Thank actually, you. that was my second question was going to be about Miss Madam Stephanie St. Clair's story. So yeah. you went right <laughs> into it. So that's great. <laughs> so let's talk about Harlem Queen Live at Podstream oh, Studios. Yes. What can audio, uh, audiences expect from these live performances and how do they differ from the podcast experience? Well, okay. That's something, honestly, I've never done a live show, radio show before. So that's something, honestly, I had to figure out myself. I mean, I was saying earlier, you just work with what you have, what you know first. And that's what I did. I knew that. Um, first of all, Podstream Studios is awesome in Times Square. Chris, the young man who who uh, runs or owns the studio, I don't know if he owns what whatever. Chris is the is the join. Like Chris Colbert, Philly. yes, thank Chris you. Colbert thank of you. DCP Association. Yes, yes. <laughs> thank you. And um, I consider them a sponsor of this, and it's a lovely, lovely facility. Beautiful, warm. They have everything there, and I'm very excited to do the live show. What I've learned is that um, with a live show, I can only have like four or five characters, right? I cannot have my, you know, 10 characters, my cop, my, you know, taxi driver, my uh, secretary, you know, I cannot have. So I wanted to limit it to four or five because of space, okay? And, and talking about the craft of audio, I did not want to overwhelm the audience and the listeners with too many people. Without, when you write an audio, you need to take the time to introduce your characters. You need to take the time for your listener to learn the different voices, the different people. And with a live show, we did not have that time. I figured we would not have that time. So I wanted to include uh, like five people and I wanted to include people that if you listen to the show, you would already know these characters. Even if you don't listen to the show, you can jump right into these big characters like Dutch Schultz, like Stephanie St. Clair, like Polly Adler, who actually all three of them actually existed. And um, Polly Adler was a madam. She ran a brothel brothels, plural, throughout the city. And uh, Wilhelmina, who is portrayed by Kara Young, who is currently on Broadway in Pearly Victorious with Leslie Odom Jr. A uh, Wilhelmina is based on an actual black woman who was an accountant for the, the um, policy bankers. Like, the, the, she really, this was her job. She really did do this. I mean, of course, I fudged it. And we talk about, you know, fact and fiction and made her the uh, accountant for uh, Dutch Schultz because he's tangible. But um, anyway, so I wanted to keep it, limit the number, make it people that you would recognize. And writing the story with live audio in mind, I knew I couldn't have like kids in the street playing stickball like I did in episode three or something of the last season. I couldn't have that. I couldn't have a lot of traffic. You know, I couldn't have um, like a big speakeasy scene where everyone's drinking and gambling and there's music. Okay. So, I mean, I had to limit in my mind I mean, maybe the sound designer is like, I could have done that. But in my mind, I'm thinking I wanted to keep it to footsteps. I wanted to keep it to a car motor, one or two drinks, maybe light a cigarette, you know, open a door, you know, that type of thing. So I rewrote this just for live, a live performance. And um, I wanted to limit the sound 
before a live Foley artist to do. I mean, I've never done Foley. I don't even know a Foley artist. I just met our Foley artist. She's great, uh, Ellie. And um, I, I'm so excited. Like, I'm amazed about like how you can, oh, this is what I used to make that sound. And she jingles something and it sounds like, I'm like, I. it's just amazing. The art of Foley to me is incredible. And um, so, yeah, I made the story a little more in my mind, simple, quote unquote, simple, but I still wanted it to fit in with the storyline of season four. So the live show will be episode three of season four, and there will be four episodes of season four. That's cool. And I plan to be there like, like. For real. Yay! <laughs> I put a ticket aside for you and I was like, put a question mark. So now I'm going to oh, remove the question mark. Yes, please, please. <laughs> I am traveling <laughs> to oh New York gosh. for that. that. That's a given. I can't wait. I really can't. Um, it's something that I, I really do want to experience. I put aside my audio drama days, but I'm moving right back to it uh, because it's, it's a love. And there's a man named Donnie Betts in Colorado. I'm not sure if you've heard of him, but Richard Durham, was our first audio, Black audio drama during the golden era of radio. Yes. Uh -huh. And Donnie Betts bought the rights to Richard Durham's show. Okay. And so he still does these in Colorado. Nice. And every show is a live show. Every wow. single episode of this podcast is live. Wow. So I'm going to connect you with him also yeah. uh, so that you can even gain more for, for this experience. Because I have this feeling that once you get the bug, <laughs> once you experience this, you're going to be like, we yeah. have to do more of this. We have to do yeah. more. Oh, so for sure. Awesome. I thank yeah. you for saying that. I I love, I would love, I can't wait to meet uh, Mr. Betts. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, I'm already thinking about, okay, what can we do next? Live. Yes, <laughs> yes. absolutely. All right. So kind of in that same vein, but going back to almost the beginning of our conversation and you were talking about the adaptation of visual scripts to audio. Mm -hmm. And now you're going back <laughs> From audio <laughs> to visual, right? In, in a way, and um, I don't know how much you are involved in that that part of this re redirection and readapting that, but with that potential of it becoming uh, a movie and it's happening, mm -hmm. can you share now how that transition from audio to visual media has been, and what challenges and opportunities you you've encountered? Oh wow! Well, I can blab about this whole experience for hours, for days, really. Um, I initially wrote the script as a feature film, like way back. I launched the audio drama in 2019. In 2018, 2017, I wrote it as a feature. Then I rewrote it as a TV series because I figured, okay, this will create more opportunity for me. And yes, I did, like, like we discussed, I did second round and all of that exciting stuff. And then I adapted it to just audio because for example, um, the opening scene I had in the feature, I think, or maybe the pilot is all, honestly, is a blur now. TV pilot was a scene at Abyssinian Baptist Church, which is right out here on 135th Street. And uh, Powell was the minister because Adam Clayton Powell's father uh, was very fair-skinned, very, very fair. He probably could have passed for white if he chose to, but he did not. And so I had this whole sermon of Powell and him like trying to help the sister Stephanie here in the pew and the choir and how, you know, the whole church experience. To me, it's a no brainer. I grew up in the church anyway, but I could not do that in audio because I do not have a choir. I do not have access to a choir. And I'm sorry, I've been in church I love church, but sometimes a sermon can be a little boring unless you're like in the midst of it and you can feel the pew shaking and the hand clapping and the guitar and the drumming and the tambourine and all that good stuff. So I had to completely change the church. I took out the church and I put a parade instead. <laughs> and so in the first episode, I have a Marcus Garvey Great. Now I fudged the timeline a little bit with this because Marcus Garvey 
may not have been in Harlem at the time of this story, but um, I went at this parade and they used to have these huge UNIA parades, the United Negro Improvement Association parades that I did not know this, but started Midtown, like 50th, mid, I think of Midtown as 50th Street, all the way up to 145th Street. I mean, thousands and thousands of people. This is phenomenal. So because with the parade, I could have the footsteps, the marching in the parade. I could do a few car motors. I could find band music to use as a band marching. And I found an actual announcer, radio host at that time in the 1920s. That's something else I thought I was going to have to make up, like a gangster or mobster or whatever, quote. I thought I was going to have to make that part up, but there was an actual, I'm sure he was not the only one, Black radio host in the 1920s. And so that's the person I used. And I had a microphone. He could do the loudspeaker and the, you know, fiddle with the microphone. And so when I transferred it to an audio, I had to think about the sounds first, like these places that make interesting sounds, not a church, but a parade. And so that was taking it from a TV to an audio. Now I'm going back to a feature. And now I know so much more about Stephanie St. Clair than I did. And, and I'm a better writer. I mean, because I've had the opportunity to write for all these years. And I know more about Stephanie St. Clair. I know more about the history. And there are things in there that I want to pop. Like uh, Stephanie St. Clair had a child, but her child died very young in real life. But in my story, her child grows up and her child is very light-skinned. She passes. She has her daughter set up to pass. Like she sets her daughter up. To, I mean, no one asks her, oh, is this child black? Why? Why would they? She just never corrected them. So her daughter thinks that she's white. And she learns that her mother is Stephanie St. Clair, a quote unquote mobster, quote unquote gangster, running a quote unquote illegal lottery <laughs> that is, you know, supporting the community. And her daughter is upset. I'll say that mildly. You got to listen to the show to hear how upset she is. And so I wanted the bad guy to be someone, a creation of Stephanie St. Clair. I wanted it to be a reflection of her putting herself out. And so I thought the daughter would be a reflection of that more so than Lucky Luciano. I mean, sure, he's an outside enemy, sure. Or Dutch Schultz. But I wanted the daughter to be like, just like Stephanie, just like her mother. And what would her mother do? And so that's where I took some creative liberties. And I love that. And like I said, I was always influenced by like, Nella Larson's book, Passing, and uh, Wallace Thurman's The Blacker, The Berry, and Dorothy West, and of course, the, the film, The Imitation of Life. And so anyway, in the fe feature, I have more of that story, not the whole story. It's not a cradle to grave biopic, but I took more liberties with being able to show more of the world now. Like I can really show um, Alayla Bundle's White Tower, her soirees. I can really show the workhouse that Stephanie St. Clair was sentenced to and really show the big glamorous world, the bands, Duke Ellington and his bands and the guys in their suits and uh, the champagne. I mean, it was prohibition, but we know that New York was not a dry city and the mayor hung out <laughs> and drank. The one thing I'm so, which I didn't know at the time, but I learned about recently is up in Harlem, they used to call it quote unquote jungle alley, right? Up in the one thirties somewhere and right central Harlem, which is where all of the musicians went after they performed in the clubs, like the cotton club, which was not integrated. Like, you know, it was segregated. They will go up further up and go hang out and and play music until I would imagine the wee hours of the morning. So I wanted to show more of that for the people who grew up knowing about the Harlem Renaissance and want something 
more to know something different besides we know the Zora Neale Hurston, the Langston Hughes, the blah, the Apollo, blah, blah, blah. But I wanted to show Connie Zen, for example, which I forget exactly where that was. But now I, I live in Harlem, so I go to where these places existed. It's an apartment building. I'm like, do people know you were just talking about walking with your daughter on these streets? Mm -hmm. Do people know how historical these places yeah. are? <laughs> um, yeah. So... Yeah, I think that's the biggest difference with um, the feature now is now I can go back and put in those big uh, scenes, those big places, those big sounds, you know, without feeling like I needed to explain it. Yeah, yeah. And what's so exciting, Yanni, and I don't know if this has dawned on you yet, but feature films that are book adaptions, right? It's like, did you read the book yet? This one, did you listen to the podcast first? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. a different experience. And that is amazing. And a testament to how audio can really be a cornerstone to build on top of. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. that's really cool. I can't <laughs> wait. All right, all right. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. So you've highlighted the importance of the community of artists and creators um, who you work with, how has community influenced your work and what role do collaborations play in your projects? Okay, so community is something I'm just learning is like currency, okay? Like as a creative independent artist, your community is your resource, you know? And I'm not just talking money, but like dollars and cents, but as far as, you know, your actors, your people who are going to read your script and tell you, well, I don't know why you have a church. Like who's, who's Adam Clayton Powell, you know? Um, the actors reading your script, fundraising, helping, they will support you financially, which is amazing. I mean, like, you know, give $25 here. I mean, it's just phenomenal. It's like, I'm so touched when people take out their credit cards. You know, like, I don't even know where my credit card is right now, but people will find their credit card in their bag somewhere in another room, walk back to the computer, punch in those numbers and click, okay. I mean, that to me is a lot <laughs> and they do it. And I'm so appreciative of that. And spreading the good word, can't stop talking about Experience J. Like, Black audio dramas exist, the whole hashtag and the whole community behind with that of getting the word out, marketing, publicity, like Afros and audio. I mean, yes, I put you on my resume. Yes, I did. And my CV, as we, we call it, getting the word out, telling people that we are here, that this is what exists. I feel like Fable and Folly Network, of course, like my shows are all on Fable and Folly and I'm able to sustain my work because they support me and my shows and help me sell ads and get sponsors. I mean, another wonderful thing about the live show at Podstream Studios at four o'clock is that Harlem Brewing is going to provide refreshments for us. We are going to hang out and have some good Harlem brewed beer <laughs> at Harlem Queen. That is community. That is support. I realized how that is your value. That is your currency. Those are the people who subscribe and listen and, and like you and experience Jay help me out. That's why I am able to do what I do. I mean, I would not have been able to do it if I in my writing group, they were all like, oh yeah, make it an audio drama. Great, great, great. Uh, I was like, great, <laughs> I need an actor. And they were like, I'll act. And a studio, they helped me find this. I mean, I cannot say that is how I'm able to do what I do, community. Absolutely, yeah. mic drop as they say. <laughs> so drawing from your experience, what key piece of advice would you give the podcast hosts and creators especially those starting in the audio drama genre? Oh, okay. So audio dramas, I can speak to. Um, listen to audio dramas, number one. It's really helpful. For me, it helped me to learn what's out there, listen to what's out there, because even under the umbrella of audio dramas, there are different formats. Like you have 
narrator driven audio dramas where there's a narrator who tells the story you have narrative devices i call them quote unquote narrative devices where a character will find a recording or some video um and then you have things like mine and yours and experience jay's well which is a kind of a mix of both of like characters acting out the story no narrator at all you're just in the story and then you have anthologies, short stories, and uh, then you have one person telling a story. I think it's important to learn what's out there and figure out where your writing, your voice fits in all of this. Like I said, I've always wanted to write TV, so I wrote mine as a way of the characters are in this world, um, not as a person telling a story or a personal essay. So um, listen and figure out how you want your format to be. And of course, write, write, write. I mean, I know that sounds so cliche, but it's the truth. And I personally think every writer should have a writing group or several people who will read your writing and give you feedback on it. I think it's kind of like taking uh, ballet classes and you need point shoes. I mean, yeah, you can do it without point shoes, but it's just part of the artwork <laughs> to have the right tools. I feel like that's an important resource or tool and community, as we were saying. And then going into the production of it, work with what you know. You'd be surprised with who you know and who has access to what. And you get your recording studio, you get your actors, you get your sound designer, you get your editor. I like to pay people. I always like to at least offer people gas money. Like I grew up <laughs> in South Jersey. Everyone had a car. Everyone, I like a long time ago, everyone carried two or three dollars to offer gas money because <laughs> that's how much it was to fill up a tank in those days. I know that's not the case anymore but have some budget to at least offer someone, people something, gas money or coffee or uh, dinner or something. Because this is, at least for me, for the work that the shows that I do, the stories that I tell are very historical. I expect my actors to know the history. I mean, I don't expect them to come at it fully formed, but I, do explain to them the history. And when I say a mid-Atlantic accent, I expect them to know what a mid-Atlantic accent is and why were people speaking. If they don't know, I will explain that. But the point I'm trying to make is that they, I expect them to do a lot of work as well. I mean, I've done the research. I would love it if they could do it as well. And so I want to compensate or show my appreciation to them for like reading a book or listening to a YouTube video or, or setting up, if we're recording remotely at home, setting up your closet, putting stuff in your closet or out of your closet so that we can record. I value, I know it takes me a long time to do stuff. It takes me, long. I mean, this is probably the first Christmas where I put down my tree before New Year. So I, I want to show people that I appreciate their time and, and contribution. So that's why I want to compensate people. So yeah, those are my, hmm. I think, four biggest points. Okay. Okay. And I know I didn't ask myself this question, but when it comes to like that script writing and we think about writing and the, the our advice and audio writing, you can't just say, the news was on. No, right. we have to hear a news reporter. We have to hear the scene, right? Yes. You can't just say nice shoes. You have to say, man, those are some nice black and You got to <laughs> exactly. get in it. Yeah, that's that's yeah. how you move. And the biggest thing about audio dramas is that the dialogue, if that's your story, it drives the story, right? Yes. Everything that's yes. being said out of the mouth is what's telling the environment, is creating the ambiance. Is pushing the story along. Yes. So audio dramas is its own thing, and it is really a special genre. Yeah. Uh, it takes some skill. It does. It's outstanding. I think it's a great, if you're a writer, a storyteller, it's a great outlet. It's a great venue. I mean, you know how they say TV is a writer's medium, the film is a director's medium. Audio drama is a writer's medium. 
And I love how you make audio dramas. You have to describe things for the listener. I mean, even to the actors, I tell them, I'm sorry. You have to say this, the yellow dress was pretty because it's just the work, the craft, as they say. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you for that. Hopefully uh, folks who are wanting to get into audio drama, I know you said it some really key things that I hope that they are able to work off of because it is important that we create more audio dramas. As I said, I think before we were recording, uh, one of the things that I understand very well is that during a golden era of radio, we were not there. Uh, mm -hmm. We were not allowed in that space. And when we were there, they were making fun of us through their voices and creating characters that just like television mm -hmm. were not actually our lived experiences of sure. who we were. Mm -hmm. And so this is our time. This is our opportunity to create mm -hmm. an exhaustive library, just like yeah. if you go back to the Golden Era Radio. Yeah. There is there is a library to this day of um of the work. Mm -hmm. We're gonna we, we do this now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, and there I'm looking forward to more. And it's an art and, and we get to teach that. I think it yeah. I think this is what we get to do now. And I'm excited mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. So this is my last question before I ask you to let people know how people can find you. But is there a specific episode or moment in Harlem Queen that you would like to highlight for new listeners? Is there one episode that you're like, we you really want to listen to this? <laughs> All right. This wow. Oh, gosh. I wish I was prepared. Well, other than the live show, which is going to be its own incredible experience. And like I have said, what went into crafting that and making that, I'm very excited about. Honestly, now that I think about it in season three, I think it's episode two, where for the first time I have three characters in a scene. Yeah. And I rarely did that because for listening, I didn't want listeners to get confused, but I have three characters in a scene. They're all women. They're all women of color. So we have Stephanie St. Clair, who is the policy queen. And then we have Wilhelmina, who is the accountant to Dutch Schultz. She was an act based on an actual Black woman as well. And then we have Rosa, who is also based on an actual person who existed, who was the girlfriend to one of the policy kings. And when he was sent to jail, she took over his business. So she's running like a multi-million dollar I mean, this is 1926, 28. She's running his business while he's in jail. So I'm excited about that because I feel like it's good to know that Stephanie Sinclair was amazing, but there, she was not the only one. There were a lot of smart, mathematically inclined, business inclined Black women, women of color who existed at that time, who ran businesses and made like cleaning businesses, hair businesses, uh, food restaurants, policy banks. I told you about the women's clubs, stores, um, educators. I just wanted people to know that we were doing things then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I'm very proud of that scene. We are an enterprising people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Yanni, it's been so great talking to you. Um, you kind of revitalized my joy in audio dramas, um, both yes. having listened to Harlem Queen, as well as just us geeking about audio dramas. <laughs> it is such an amazing genre and, and very different from the just the word podcast. Yes. It is it's more, it is different. It is creative. It's all of these things. <laughs> And, and, um, and I just really, really enjoyed this conversation with you today. So let people know how they can find <laughs> Harlem Queen and you, social media, websites, whatever. Okay, great. Thank you. So I am on Instagram. I'm uh, Yanni, Y-H-A-N-E dot writes, W-R-I-T-E-S dot audio. And I have my own newsletter on Substack. You can go to Harlem Queen dot substack dot com dot com and I have a newsletter where I write all about like how I made these things and how I researched and living in Harlem and being inspired by riding my bike past Minton's Playhouse and 
all of that good stuff. And my personal website is yanniwashingtonsmith.org. And on there, you can also listen to my podcast, Harlem Queen and 1972 and Mona May. And that's it. Awesome. Well, thank you again. I want to give a big thanks to our Afros and Audio and Black Podcasters Association members for supporting our commitment for community and collaboration. If you'd like to join the Black Podcast Association, a link will be in the description below. And if you want to join us at the sixth annual Afros and Audio Podcast Festival, visit afrosandaudio.com. Follow Afros and Audio on all social media channels, and you can follow me at Talib Jasir on Instagram. So thanks again, Yanni, for being a part of Afros and Audio's Black History Month interview series. And one more time, Podstream. Saturday, February 10th at 4 o'clock, Podstream Studios, Harlem Queen Live. And thank you so much for having, I mean, you know, like I fangirl sometimes. I'm trying to be cool. I really do. I mean, there's some people in this world that I just fangirl. And I'm so glad I got finally got to like talk to you and listen to your show and I'm just, you're an inspiration, truly, truly, truly. Thank you. Thank you so much. It means a lot. It really does. And uh, right back at you. So we'll talk again soon. I'm so glad we had this conversation. Uh, thank you. Yes, you're very welcome. Thank you.